Welcome. Thank you so much for coming to our coffee talk this month. So great to see some familiar faces as well as some folks I haven't really met yet. So that's absolutely fantastic. For those of you I don't know, my name is Emma Marston and I am the interpretive curator here at the Des Plaines History Center. We have a fabulous presentation for you today. Uh, just a couple quick notes with some upcoming events that you don't want to miss. Uh, we do these programs every month and next month will be uh, June 9th. Uh, featuring uh, Billy Caldwell, who is part of the Saganosh neighborhood in Chicago. A very interesting Native American story uh, right here in uh, Northern Illinois. So definitely check that out if you have a moment. And we'll also be having a very special event on Sunday, June 12th. This will be our Chicago Summer Opera Preview. We have uh, a bunch of students uh, at, the, at the Chicago Summer Opera. They'll be coming to do a preview of their performances. You'll see some real opera singers doing their work, showing off some songs, learn a little bit about opera. It'll be a really interesting uh, day, and I highly recommend coming out for that if you have a moment. Uh, and again, all the information for our programs right up at the front there. So if you're interested, please do grab a flyer. Our speaker today, Katherine Lambrecht. She is a veteran of culinary competitions at the Lake County and Illinois State Fairs. She is a former University of Illinois Extension volunteer with a specialties in master food preserver and master gardener. She is a member of, the, or excuse me, a founder of the Greater Midwest Foodways Alliance, which you can see on the screen right there, uh, the Chicago Foodways Roundtable, and the LTHforum.com, a Chicago culinary chat site. She is the program director for the Highland Park Historical Society and the Illinois Mycological Association, as well as the editor of the Heirloom Recipes from the Illinois State Fair, a bicentennial project, which you can see right here in the front there if you would like a book afterwards. And uh, one last thing, please do, if you enjoy this program, this is all thanks to our great friends at Village Bank and Trust. Uh, Melba is in the back there, so if you are interested, please do stop by, say hi, and uh, thank them for all of the, the support they give to us, because we wouldn't be able to do these programs without uh, the Village Bank. So, Catherine, please take it away. Okay, you did the full bio. I don't have to do too much. To <laughs> I like to uh, hype you up. I gotta get you going. I quite often do the least amount of introduction that you could ever manage. I figure all I can do is ruin somebody's life. But I didn't, no, not today. By the way, there's one other piece to all that, and I know I think that's how you found me, was I'm a Road R-O-A-D, scholar with the Illinois Humanities. Okay, because I can talk louder, I can talk closer, but that's a problem after a while. Anyway, yes, yeah, so I'm Katherine Lambrecht, which you just told me, so I don't need to go through. Sometimes I end up telling people a lot about myself. But anyway, the first thing I ever cooked was eggs when I was three years old. My parents were in bed. They could smell stuff going on in the kitchen. And there was nobody else, big time adults in the house except them. So they got up to check and there I was, standing on a chair, frying some eggs. I, either I was desperate, creative, or <laughs> just took matters into my hands, I don't know. You know, I asked my three-year-old self and they go, I don't remember. I just know we've heard about it many, many times inside the family. But I've always been kind of interested in food. And many of my, as you know, hobbies relate to food. And Mushroom Club, Illinois Mycological Association, you know, that began looking for wild mushrooms for the pot. Now, not so much anymore, but that was then, this is now. Um, but one of the bigger influences was spending about five months living with my grandmother when I was about 10 years old. Uh, we had just moved to Chicago after living on the East Coast, and we weren't really clear if we were staying in Chicago, so we didn't exactly race to buy a new home. So I lived with my grandmother to go to school uh, during the week. And I was kind of curious, because we'd always been there for suppers and lunches and holiday meals, but I had never been there for everyday food. I had observed in my household there was everyday food and company food. And everyday food, you know, was certain things that, you know, my mother, well, she had one particularly one that she really liked, and it was this sauce. 
And this sauce could be on spaghetti. This sauce could be sloppy joes. This sauce, if she knew about it, but she didn't, it would have been tacos. You know, I mean, this sauce covered a lot of sins. But my grandmother, you know, I was really curious what her everyday food would be. It was terrific. It was really, really good. And she was one of those people where one meal flowed into the other. So last night's vegetables might get pureed and her osterizer would be the soup that went with our lunch and all sorts of wonderful things. And she used fresh mushrooms. My other grandmother used Jolly Green Giant, and my mother didn't touch them at all. <laughs> so, you know, this was, this was kind of my life. So living with grandma was terrific. Going home back to my family was another story, because the food wasn't as good as grandma. And I sort of expected more now that I had seen the other side. And my father, I mean, around this time, my mother got pregnant with my youngest sister. And they said, you know, if you like it better, you want to cook, go ahead. And I did. <laughs> and, and it was very nice. They, they kind of gave me kind of like, at that time anyway, effectively kind of carte blanche, though they know I'm economical, so I don't go too wild. But, you know, if I needed to buy a cookbook, go buy the cookbook. So it was great. And I made my first Thanksgiving dinner 13 or 14 years old. So I'm, I'm coming up to my 50th anniversary of making Thanksgiving dinners in a few years. We're not trying to count how many, but we're coming up to that point in life. Um, but my activities with the state and the county fair came in a back-ended kind of a way. I had a friend who was chronic illness, and she would go to doctor's offices and bring uh, quilting squares to work on. So she submitted her project, her finished project, to the Lake County Fair, and she got grand champion in the sewing department. So she said, you got to come and see it. And I came, and I appreciated her work. It was lovely. But it wasn't, but it wasn't, I don't sew that much, but when I walked over to the foods department, that's when I started looking at everything and go, well, I could do better than that. So the following year, I did. Now, up until then, by the way, what I did know was from this movie. You know, I loved the, the pig contest, but I especially liked that mincemeat contest where they, all the family and everybody kept adding more brandy to it, and when the judges finally did evaluate it, they got schnookered. You know, and she got the grand prize. Well, why not? Everybody was pretty happy by then. So my first time that I went to the Lake County Fair, um, I think I was like maybe third prize, something like that. And there was a little note, and they said, your crust is too thick. And so I knew, at least when I'm in a competition, I need to make crust thin. And I did the following year. Oh, that was Lake County Fair. But the following year, I did what they told me to do. That's actually not the pie. It's a stand-in. Because back then, I never took pictures of my food. Never occurred to me to take pictures of my food. But I still had the ribbon. Well, that was pretty good to me. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I got, I got you know, uh, what was it? Grand, I got champion. But the following year, I got grand champion and best of show. And yeah, I was impressed myself. And I almost pretty much came to an end doing the competition there because after a while you're competing against yourself. You know, these kinds of things don't happen every time. And then you feel disappointed when you don't. So I just sort of moved on to the state fair. Now there was an article in the Tribune about how to compete at the state fair. They said, don't go for the, uh, the pies and the cakes and the cookies. Go for the more obscure contests. So I went for the foreign breads contest. At the time, I had somebody who was working with us who was from Sweden. <laughs> I made Swedish lipa bread. I never made it before. I have never made it since. <laughs> I simply followed the instructions and drove it down to Springfield, and ta-da, I won. But going down to the state fair, had a lot of, you know, sidebar things that happened. Like, they couldn't believe I drove from Chicago to participate. Because when you participate in the foods competitions, you go before the fair opens. You go, like, the Saturday or Sunday before the fair opens. So that's, what, 400 
mile round trip roughly and they wanted to know if I knew anybody who might be interested in supporting a few contests for them because they didn't know how the whole contest thing worked and I said you know I did give them some names of people and so I was able to help at least get them a few more you know contests but anyway I was really really pleased and that guy was really really disgusted and as a master gardener, master food preserver volunteer, I also got to judge at the Lake County Fair the 4-H projects. And I don't know if, if you go into that hall, it's just dazzling with blue, red, and white ribbons. So let me explain a little bit how that works just to give you a sense for the future. Each project is, is, is uh, the uh, each project has a criteria and so when we're given as judges there's a criteria that they have to meet if they meet everything they get the blue ribbon if they need a little bit of more extra effort to make it perfect then they get the red ribbon and if they're far off the mark or God knows where they are at that moment they get the white ribbon so it's sort of the consolation prize but for instance like if you got a blue ribbon in the apple pie contest all the different apple pies that had blue ribbons are compared with each other and they get the champion. And then all the different pies of different categories are compared and that's where you might get your grand champion. And then you have to help select you know, the, um, who gets to go to state and all sorts of things. So that's how it works at the fair. And I did one time, and I have friends here from the Deerfield Historical Society, they might appreciate this, me and two other friends judged the pie contest at the McHenry County History Center some years ago. And we had been told that it was really good that we didn't know anybody, because we really didn't. And I had 40 pies, we had two hours, and many of the contestants are sitting closer than anybody in this room. And there was one lady with a red face muttering to herself, I'm not going to win self-fulfilling prophecy when you submit a cobbler and not a pie. That was, and by, by the way, the moment that contest was over, we got out of there because we could just feel the tension building in the room. We just did not want to be there. <laughs> but it was an interesting, interesting, you know, project. So back in 2007, we founded the Greater, uh, Greater, Foodways, Greater Midwest Foodways Alliance. And we were starting to look for projects that we could do. And I suggested, why don't we sponsor a contest at the state fair? I said, because I knew that they're looking for people. And not, if it's not just Illinois, it will be the other um, states in the region. And our first time we did it was in 2009 in Illinois. And they all thought I was a genius. No, it was just you know all my other activities kind of blending together. But the contest that we have, which is the um, Family Heirloom Recipe Contest, 50% is writing a history of the recipe, talking about how it's used in your family, talking about where it came. And we try to have them recipes that are 50 years and older. I do recognize people don't always know what that is and how old, how old a recipe is. But we, at least we try to encourage digging. It's a nice way to put it. And 40% uh, is the prepared recipe, and 10% is, it, it doesn't, I don't want it to sound trivial, but it's sort of the beauty contest, because a lot of people put a lot of effort in presentation. They get, you know, the, the handwritten card, they might find family photos, family china. So we, we try to, to honor that. But that's usually like the last piece in the decision making process. And, but I can tell you, you can have a fabulous recipe and you may have a one-line story, you're not going to win. But if you have even a, somewhat of an okay recipe, but you have a really good history on it, that puts you in really good, solid footing. Yeah, and then of course we came up with this, this book, um, which was a very last-minute thing. And it was influenced because we have this group called the uh, Lake County McHenry um, County uh, Small Museum Alliance. And they had produced a very nice book, and I kind of borrowed on the idea. I saw, if they could do it, it was more like, I could do it too. Now, here's some of the people that we're kind of going to meet today, but we'll come back and tell you about them later. Um, but when we come into the uh, state, into the Lake, uh, sorry, Illinois State Fair, 
we walk into a table with all sorts of food and displays arranged. Um, at other fairs, we tend to do it live um, review, but at the Illinois State Fair, we can't because they have too many other things going on at the same time. So our first story is going to be the bacon, potato, and cheese casserole. By the way, it takes two and a half hours to bake. Yes, to bake. Yes. So here's the story that came with it. There is a season for everything. As an avid animal lover and growing up on a farm in the South, the fall always troubled me. During the springtime, we would have calves, chicks, ducklings, piglets, puppies, and kittens on the farm. Spring was my favorite time of year, and I would always, have, and I would always be the one that would gravitate to the runts of the litter and try to save them so they weren't left to die by the mother or called by my father. It was a reality that runts seldom lived, but I always wanted to try. Coming from a farming family, the reality was that throughout the year, animals would have to be slaughtered for the family to sell and eat. That realization didn't make things any easier for me. We always had spring pigs to sell to other farmers who didn't raise hogs. And I would always try to hide the runt of the litter because I wanted to hand raise the runts myself. I knew deep in my heart that eventually the piglet would grow into a full-sized hog and that would either be slaughtered or have to be sold. But that didn't keep me from trying my best to hide the little thing. In spring of 1969, I was still young and fairly naive around the farm. I'm now 53 years old and my memory of this spring is still clear in my head. Our sow had given birth to 14 piglets that spring. There happened to be two runts of that litter. My dad explained to me they needed to be culled because they probably wouldn't live anyways. But being a stubborn little man, I begged him to let me try and bottle feed him. One was a male and one was a female. I was only eight or nine at the time. I got permission from my school teacher to bring the piglets in to class each day so I could bottle feed them. She thought it was great to have the other students help bottle feed them and learn about them as the piglets grew. By the end of the school year, both the piglets had survived with feedings every two to three hours around the clock when they were little. They were now big enough to sell. I didn't realize that my dad had, that my dad had decided to keep the male or why. We kept the male and sold the female for $25. And at that time, $25 was a lot of money for us to have, plus I knew that she would be used for breeding. I had no idea what was in store for Bart. I kept feeding Bart and he continued to get fatter. October rolled around and my father and grandfather, grandmother and mom sat me down and we all had a long heart to heart talk. They explained that the first frost would soon be coming and that they were going to have to slaughter Bart. We couldn't afford to keep him over the winter. Feed was expensive even then. It had to be done. I was heartbroken. I ran from the room yelling and screaming absurdities that I knew better to even entertain in my head, much less let them come out of my mouth. I cried for two weeks. School was back in session when the first frost hit that year. I knew that weekend would be Bart's last day. I asked a neighbor friend of mine if I could spend the weekend with them because I didn't want to be at the house when it happened. When I got home late Sunday, and I didn't even go to church that Sunday morning because I was mad at even at God, at least I thought I was. The dinner table was set and everyone was silent. You could, you could hear the crickets underneath the porch chirping away, nothing but silence. Mom had made my favorite for dinner, fried chicken and potato salad. I just sat there with tears welling up in my eyes. I didn't say a word. I knew I would be in for, for a thrashing if I let out another round of smart mouth to my mom and dad. I didn't eat much that night, but when it was time for me and my brother to go to bed, daddy said, I'll be up in a few minutes to talk to you. My brother slept on the couch that night. I knew I was gonna get it for not eating my dinner or for not going to church that day. I waited in bed 
and I put on two pairs of pajamas and extra socks in preparation for my punishment. Daddy didn't even knock on the door. He walked right on in. He sat down on the edge of the bed. Neither of us said anything for about five minutes. Finally, he broke the silence. You know, son, we raise animals to sell and to have food for the winter. We have to make ends meet. You know that, right? I told my dad, yeah, I understand, but I don't have to like it or watch it when it happens. No, you don't, he responded sternly. He said to me in a low voice, uh, there is a time for everything, son. There is a time to be born and a time to die, a time to reap and a time to sow. He then said something that I've told my own son many times. And there is even a time, son, to be angry and a time to show compassion and understanding. He got up and walked out of the room. I didn't understand his words at the time, but I felt at peace with everything right then. The next morning, I came down to breakfast, and there was a bacon, potato, cheese casserole on the table for breakfast. I knew in my heart that it was Bart that was on the table. He, clearly, they don't know what's involved in bacon, bacon. I couldn't eat. I excused myself from the table and said I was going to go on to school. Mom looked at me and said, Dennis, your dad wants your help at the hog pen. I stared and said, all right. I walked slowly to the hog shed, and my dad was waiting with hog slop and water. He looked at me and said he had hurt his back slaughtering the hogs on Saturday when he slipped and fell. My dad never slipped and fell, but I didn't say anything. I grabbed the feed and water and walked up the hill to the hog pen. There was Bart. He wasn't dead. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know then that Dad had used part of the money he, we had gotten for the sow and some of the money he and Mom had saved up for Christmas presents and bought a hog from another farmer to slaughter. My dad had spared Bart. Dad walked up the hill behind me and was standing there smiling. You realize this is your Christmas present and any piglets he sires will be sold in the spring to pay for the hog we bought. I knew he was right, but my dad had shown compassion and understanding for me, for me. I ran to him and gave him a huge hug and thanked him. Even though I knew in my heart this would never happen again, I understood that sometimes we have to show understanding and compassion for others. He said, come on, let's get back to the house. Your mom made us breakfast and we have to show her we like it and appreciate her getting up at 3 a.m. to fix it for us. That was the last time my dad held my hand, but I remember it as well today as if it happened yesterday. And that was the best bacon potato cheese casserole I had ever eaten. And uh, he, I can't make it as well as my mom, but give it a try. It's simple and cheesy and loaded with bacon and potatoes. Who would argue with that one, right? Yeah. <laughs> Be prepared to spend two and a half hours for it to bake, but it's well worth the wait. And even though this recipe's been around in our family for many years, it only recently resurfaced, and it's a fan favorite at family reunions. When I was um, still involved with Extension and, and 4-H and all those things, I had the job with one other person to run the soda pop sale at the Lake County Fair. And one of my tasks was to get the children, the 4-H kids, to volunteer to help run the, the, the booths. The hardest time was Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon. Saturday afternoon was that joyful moment when their um, project animals were now auctioned off, usually for rates far higher than market value. Those kids knew how to, let's say, grease, grease the skids on that one. But Sunday afternoon is when these animals now went to their new owners. Some of them might become pets. Some of them might become farm animals. And some of those pigs just might end up at St. Mary's Pig Roast the following weekend up in Libertyville. It was very tearful. It was really trying for the kids, but it was also trying for me, the volunteer organizer, to get the kids to come. But uh, say la vie. Now this is Salt Sibarsky, it's from Latvia, but I would say this is sort of the, you know, um, 
it's a cold burst effectively. So you could say it's Russia, you could say it's Ukraine, it's it's from it's a regional favorite, let's put it that way. So salt sea barsky is a common dish brought to America in the early 1900s by my great grandparents. They left their village to brave the new world because of a famine. According to my grandmother, this was made often for lunch as it would keep till the men would come in from the fields. She usually got the job of chopping the beets, the cucumbers, the dill. Sometimes they would make it with buttermilk, other times with sour cream. It just depended on what was on hand. And I never got, I never got to meet my great grandparents. Joseph died in the 1940s from a tetanus, from tetanus contracted on the farm. Catherine died shortly thereafter from a broken heart, and this was actually entered on her death certificate. My grandmother had a huge garden with dill surrounding it, and that is my main memory of her, the smell of dill in the summer heat and in the soup. And she taught her two boys, my, my father and uncle, to make the soup, and my father taught it to me. To me, it's the perfect summer soup. It's cold, refreshing filling, and she's now teaching it to her granddaughters, and they're helping me pick the dill in my garden. So it spans five generations that I can account for, a common dish, a common thread. Two things, one was um, usually what I consider kind of like the prettiest display I put on our homepage. And, and I did that the first year, even though she did not win and she didn't win the second year. It's a lovely dish. The, 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 the problem is with the execution of the recipe. It says three quarts of water. It's too much water. So when I make it, I put the beets in the least amount of water that I can get away with. So I create a concentrate. Because you can always add water. You just can't get water out very easily. It's otherwise a very good dish. And of course, then I adjust the seasonings and everything. But I make this several times a summer, especially pre-heat wave. You know, and then we have something cold sitting in the refrigerator we could eat and not have to be um, cooking anything. Now, one of the <laughs> things about doing this contest at the fair that we never imagined would happen, but we just didn't think about this, I guess, is that sometimes you're there to help to, to, to deal with family disputes. In this case, one side of the family likes the green asparagus soup, the other side of the family thinks the white soup asparagus soup, and they wanted us to tell them which was better. <laughs> you know it. We never offered an opinion. We thought both of them were delicious in their own unique way. However, there's a lot of store, there's a lot of, of interesting um, situations that happen because of asparagus in this family that was noteworthy. The, one of the, the grandmothers was responsible for watching the children on this farm. The kids stomped on the asparagus patch. And if this had been learned by the parents, she probably would not have a job. However, um, her, uh, the, the guy who worked with the animals, who ultimately became her husband, he said, listen, it, wasn't, it was the cows that stomped on the asparagus patch. And the cows had a reputation for naughtiness. And it was understood, you know? So <laughs> <laughs> but still, this fight about asparagus soup, we would not ever, ever get in the middle of that one. So this is Beulah's chicken salad sandwiches. These were delicious and cool to the touch. Except, my, so my, my mother-in-law Beulah was an excellent cook, and she was well known for her delicious food. One particular favorite of immediate and extended family was her chicken salad sandwiches. Everyone expected her to bring these savory sandwiches to reunions and church potlucks. They were especially delicious as a cool entree for a hot picnic day, and she was always careful to keep the sandwiches well chilled. Everyone knew her sandwiches without looking for her name on the container, usually Tupperware, and I recall her dish being one of the first to empty. We almost always were served the chicken salad for our evening meal after a large holiday noon meal. This made a perfect menu as she was able to make the salad ahead and wasn't busy in the kitchen during afternoon family time. Beulah was also very particular about her presentation and always sliced off the crust of the sandwich style bread. Of course, she made breadcrumbs from the uh, 
uh, crust, you know, no waste. Because this is these are important details, you know, you don't waste. One side of the bread was covered lightly with mayonnaise and the other with soft butter, which she added to which added to the flavor and was her unique style. She always cut the sandwiches diagonally and placed them in a sandwich bags with a fold on top to assure they would always be very fresh. These sandwiches were prepared in advance of the event and chilled in the refrigerator to mellow. So we judge this usually like the second week in August. It's hot, it's humid. It's like what we've been dealing with for the last couple of days, right? Not pleasant weather. And the, the building that we, the, I think they call it the um, home economics building, is air conditioned. So I don't think people really come in there always necessarily to see the exhibits, but I think they're there to cool down, which I don't blame them. These sandwiches were cool to the touch, and we were very impressed with them. And when we were finishing judging, we pulled apart this display, uh, lifted up the sandwiches, the doilies, and underneath was a cube of ice uh, about the size, you know, kind of like, you know, ice cube trays take out the partition and just freeze that block. And then they had wrapped plastic around it and then put you know, display and sandwiches on top. That's what kept those darn things cold. We were totally big fans of that approach. I haven't done it myself that way, but I should, I really should. Um, so the next is the same person. This is oven fried chicken. Chicken as an old time favorite main dish serves up for many folks as a vast variety of memories. I've heard several senior members of our family recall one chicken dish in particular, oven fried chicken. My mother explains this was a family favorite Sunday dinner dish. Her mother would fry fresh chicken pieces just until lightly browned and then place the chicken in a roasting pan, add some liquid, cover, and bake in a slow oven. Her family would then travel to church and back in their horse-drawn carriage while the chicken baked. She further explained that her mother would fire up the oven with split wood in the summer and would use nut coal in the winter as the coal would get hotter than the wood. They also had a small oil, a coal oil stove in the washroom and her mother sometimes cooked on this in the summer. Mother recalls the excitement of her mother when one day a large truck arrived and delivered a bottle gas stove that my grandfather had ordered to surprise my grandmother. This stove was so much easier to use as they just had to light a match to ignite the stove and oven. It amazes me how grandmother knew how much fuel to use to keep the oven glowing at the right temperature for the chicken to slowly roast all morning. I noticed quite a glow also on my mother's face as her memories take her back to savor that fall off the bone tender chicken as her mother, daddy, and sister gathered around the kitchen table at noon. Mother said grandmother usually made chicken gravy also, and if they didn't have potatoes for the meal, they would eat the gravy on bread. Family meals seem to be some of the most special Sorry, memories my mother has of her childhood as their life was a simple, hardworking farm family far away from the hustle and bustle of our modern lives. When mother speaks of dinner, she means the noon meal, hence the dinner bell, which was rung to call the men in from the fields midday. What city folks and I think modern folks call dinner now was referred to by my mother's family as supper or the evening meal. I remember well the everyday dishes we used at my grandmother's when I was a child, and I'm so pleased to have found several pieces of these dishes at various uh, antique m shops. I especially enjoyed using these when serving grandmother's oven fried chicken. My grandparents still had chickens on their farm when I was a little girl, and I loved taking the grandmother's basket and go into the chicken house to carefully collect eggs. I also recall being careful to watch where to step when walking outside around the ch where the chickens strolled during the day. I also recall, with not much fondness, memories of my mother's chicken dressing day, which we kids always wondered why it wasn't called chicken undressing day. Early on a weekday morning, my mother would go to a nearby neighbor and return with a wooden crate full of noisy fryers. 
She would open the trap door, pull out one chicken, hold its neck over a stump, and chop off its head with a sharp axe. We kids were so disgusted to see the headless chicken flopping around the yard, splattering its blood everywhere. Then Mom would dunk the chicken in a bucket of very hot water and proceed to pluck off the feathers. To this day, I can still smell the stench of wet feathers and have an absolutely no desire to sleep on a feather pillow. To remove the pin feathers, Mother would hold the birds over a small fire in the yard to singe off the fine feathers. My grandmother used to do this over an open burner on the kitchen stove and one time caught her apron on fire. So this could be a dangerous step. But one by one, all the chickens were destined to the same fate. The chickens were next taken inside to the kitchen sink where the innards were taken out. The gizzard cleaned and kept along with the liver and heart. We kids thought dressing old hens were more interesting than the friars because we were intrigued to watch mom find eggs inside those chickens. Next, the birds were cut up, wrapped in plastic bags, and frozen. I don't really recall if we had fresh fried chicken for our evening meal that night, but I don't think so after all that commotion. Chicken would sound too appealing, and I think my mother would have been too tired to fry chicken. I must say it amuses me to hear young moms today complain about what a job it is to go to the grocery, to buy chicken nuggets to microwave, breaded chicken tenders ready to bake, or even to pick up a rotisserie chicken for dinner. Oh, what they don't know. Even though one could say, I know how to dress chickens, I have to be honest to say this is not one family tradition of skills I have carried on. However, I do want to carry on the tradition of Sunday oven fried chicken with my family. After a couple of recent trips to Kentucky Fried Chicken to pick up chicken after church for Mother's Day and Father's Day, I have concluded this old-fashioned oven chicken is much more economical. I have searched extensively for a recipe or directions for this dish. I have searched through many old family handwritten recipe boxes and many old cookbooks, including the domestic arts edition of the American Woman, copyright 1939 as well as questioned many seniors who admit they ate this chicken at their mother's or grandmother's home. But I have come to the conclusion that this dish was something that home cooks found so simple and commonplace that there was never the need to record as a recipe. It seems some of the best family recipes were not kept secret, but just prepared and the skill passed down through the generations along with savory memories. I have spent some delightful hours with my mother listening to her detail how her mother prepared this chicken and we now have the recipe documented. It is wonderful to have a fried chicken recipe that enables one to brown the chicken and have the mess cleaned up before mealtime. I am also so thankful I can set up my oven to the exact temperature and not have to fire it up. I recently prepared this chicken for my mother and she declared it delicious and very similar to what she remembers her mother prepared. And she seemed to sincerely enjoy this connection to her past. And after the chicken dinner, we looked at her picture album and found some childhood chicken pictures to treasure. We also enjoyed looking back through the years with my picture album and I must say, I'm not surprised or disappointed we didn't find any pictures of chicken dressing day. So instead, I can just picture cherished memories of how my, mo my mother sometimes performed unpleasant tasks to provide the best quality food possible for her family. And I'm excited to be able to prepare this chicken for my children and 11 grandchildren, as they now call this tender bone chicken to differentiate from their frequent meals of chicken tenders. And I'm also especially looking forward to preparing this dish again for my mother on her 90th birthday this coming October. Effectively, this woman reverse engineered and figured out how to prepare this recipe that was almost lost and, and documented. And, and it's, in the, it's in there in the handout. And I think she hit the nail on the, on the head, too, because 
you know, we all have these meals that we can put together quickly, the family enjoys, you know, and it's like we could almost do it without thinking because we've done it so many times. It's not the recipe that we jot down because we know it, it's right here. But it's the recipe that when you go to heaven, we're all optimistic on that, uh, when you all go to heaven, that recipe is the thing that they're gonna cherish and wish they knew. And that was the experience I had when my grandmother died. I was close to 16 and there were certain dishes she made that we loved, but suddenly we're like, who's gonna make this? Nobody knows. And she did that, you know, had the kitchen all cleaned up when you arrived and things would come out of the refrigerator or pulled out of the oven, ta-da, meal's done, uh, except you didn't see the process, which was an important element. But nonetheless, these are the recipes that you may want to consider documenting for your family. And yes, you can type it, and I have many things that I type, and I'm even now at the point where I'm, I don't have children, but I have nieces, and I contact them and I go, what recipes would you like? Because it's better we, we just learn it now while, you know, I'm not saying anything's about to happen, but you never know, right? But these are the recipes you need to document and also do it in your handwriting. Because they're going to, it's one thing to have the type print, but it will leave it more special in your handwriting. And, and yes, I have my grandmother's recipe boxes. I have a number of people, my friends' recipe boxes. But um, some of their key recipes are lost or I you know talked them into telling me what was going on but anyway um, I, this was just brilliant um, okay now <laughs> you're going to see this picture later on this is what it looked like before it was judged you're going to see the picture that I probably should have photoshopped but you, you'll, you'll, you'll understand it a little bit polenta with meat sauce Grandma passed in 1945, and although my mom was only 13, she now took over the job of preparing meals because all her other sisters were so much older, married, and did not live there anymore. My mother, my mom pre uh, remembered making and eating many meals with polenta. Um, once the cornmeal and water were mixed and cooked, forming a creamy dish of polenta, the polenta was spooned onto a wooden cutting board. The polenta was covered with a tomato sauce and sprinkled with Parmesan, and the family would gather around the table, each with their fork or spoon, and dig in. Yes, they would eat from the same cutting board this mass of polenta, each starting in their own corner and section and digging away at the delicious creamy mixture often served along with some Italian sausage. Interestingly, many times before they began eating, they would decide on a pattern to follow, perhaps to dig in with their forks and produce a map of Italy or Illinois or some cartoon character. It sounds like fun, except when you think everyone is digging in there with their own forks, eating a communal dish. And after spending the last, what, two years avoiding each other, <laughs> it's even more surprising. <laughs> How I, uh, I, I didn't, I don't know how sanitary it was, but that's what they did time and time again. My mom told me how they would upset, how she would upset their design by taking her fork and making a trail through the polenta to where the others were stationed. I don't know, you know, it's my territory, you're digging in there. Anyway, my one reason polenta was considered a special meal is that it was usually only eaten on special occasions like Thanksgiving, Christmas, or Easter. And I don't know how many ever sat down at one time to consume a board of polenta, but from the stories I've heard, I guess it would be six to ten people. I am sure it did not bother anyone as our family has always been very close. My mom and dad's parents, brothers and sisters, and their families lived within three to four blocks of our house. Yes, I was literally neighbors to most of my relatives. Since one of my aunts owned a tavern that served as a hub for family get-togethers during the holidays and important family events, we ate a lot of polenta in that, in that tavern. Their stories were mostly about eating polenta during the Depression and then World War II. It was a simple tradition brought over from Italy. And by the time I arrived on the scene in the early 1950s, they had, for the most part, gone to eating polenta in individual dishes. Also, for some reason, and maybe it was my dad's idea, we started putting a slice of cheese in the layer of polenta. And the cheese would melt and just add to the flavor and appeal of eating the polenta. 
and you see the recipe from his mother, and apparently she's gotten a microwave in the meantime, so the instructions were for microwave only, uh, at least for this case. Um, now this is a chocolate sour cream pound cake. That looks good. Yes. It, it is good, it is good. My mother, Julia Fields, was a natural born baker. Her parents immigrated from Hungary, and she was one of seven children born in America. Every special occasion and holiday called for a special dessert. Cakes, pies, yeast nut or poppy seed sweet rolls. Cobbler and of course apple strudel. At Christmas we had at least eight or nine different cookies. She was always trying new recipes. For summer get togethers or picnics, she would always bake a pound cake. When I got older, I asked her why she always took a pound cake. And she explained that it was a rich cake that did not need frosting, and people could usually carry it in their hands to eat. So no melted cakes. This chocolate sour cream pound cake is a family favorite. It didn't win. And I knew the lady was going to be heartbroken that it didn't win. And the, it was one of those years where we had, to, we had strong contenders and we had to start looking at details. She forgot to indicate how many fl cups of flour were in the recipe. It was a tight field, but when we announced who the winners were, I knew she wasn't gonna be happy. And I went right over to her to talk to her about it because I didn't want her to feel that that cake was rejected. And in, we also do this um, contest in Indiana, and one of our uh, local judges is uh, Jolene Ketzenberger, who was the food editor for the Indianapolis Star. And one year we had like 16 things to judge, and we were looking at some of the cakes, and she says, you know, these are some of these cakes that when it's seen at a pitch-in or potluck, they're the first to go. These are local favorite cakes, and they may not win. And I said, yeah, I know. It's, you know we do first, second, and third, you know, not one through 16. So it's kind of, that's where the, sometimes the situation can be a little bit unpleasant. Um, now, this is Grandma Moore's pasta salad. This was submitted in 2011. And we have Ruth's pasta salad from 2014. The difference is one has two teaspoons of prepared mustard, and the other one has a teaspoon of prepared mustard. They are virtually the same recipe. I don't think they copied this off the website. My feeling is this was a favorite on the potluck circuit in the Springfield area, and it just happened to arrive via two different people. And I did not even notice that this had happened until um, I was, uh, editing this book and putting it together and it was like oh that's interesting two pasta recipes two pasta recipes that are the same <laughs> it was like well I guess the joke's on me uh, but in any case that's that's what we did <laughs> we, we it was, in, in any case so the, the the gal who had the asparagus um, also submitted this peanut brittle recipe um, I've known Amy when I was even still like, you know, running as a contestant. So we're talking at least 25 years ago. The first time I met her, she goes, we're the most famous candy company in Atlanta. And my thought bubble is like, hmm, how did somebody in Central, Amer uh, Central Illinois pull that off in Atlanta, Georgia? until it was Atlanta, Illinois, an exit I have passed many, many, many times. It's before Funk's Grove on the, um, on 55 on your way to Springfield. But I had just never, you know, it's just one of those exits you just drive past. I just didn't know. Anyway, on their family farm, at one point, they had, they were, their candy company was in a section of their house, and it's a pretty large house. It caught fire, and they had not transcribed all of the recipes. And one that was lost was the peanut brittle. And that was a big sore point because that was one of their, their favorite recipes, but they hadn't transcribed it. So she went to a farm auction and she won what she thought was three boxes of cookbooks, turned out to be one a price per book in the three boxes of cookbooks, which she declined to do. So she randomly picked up this book. She ultimately did buy all the other books. While she's flipping through this book, 
and she's starting to recognize people in her neighborhood. Now, her neighborhood is a little bit more expansive than what we think of a neighborhood because they live on a 2,000 acres corn and soybean farm. So it's like the neighbors could be a couple of miles away, but it's still their neighbor. She recognized people in that neighborhood and then turned the page and there was her grandmother's recipe in her handwriting. I know, it does, just about makes the hair stand up on your arms, doesn't it? Yeah, the, just the whole, if she'd taken no other book, she still was like, damn lucky to have picked up that one. And so, so one of the things that was mentioned in the introduction, I'm with the Illinois Mycological Association, which in my house is referred to as Mushroom Club. I hate to start and sound like an old lady, but I've belonged to this club now for over 35 years. I never thought I would belong that long. But the people I meet today, they're young, they're into foraging, they're into a natural lifestyle. Back then, many of the people I met were there because the key member of their family who knew how to identify mushrooms had gone to heaven and they didn't know what they were doing and came to us. So this story very much reflects the culture and the people I met back then. As far back as I can remember, these mushrooms were always on grandmother's uh, holiday tables. Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, I often wonder why we didn't have them every time we got together at her house. Now after making this coveted recipe one fall weekend in October with my Uncle Joe and my sister Cindy, I now know why labor intensive and low yield. But before I got into that, let me go back to the beginning and give you a little story. My grandmother, Agnes Chabuda, Chuduba Holas, came to this country with her sister Marie and their husbands Anton and Cyril Holas. Yes, two sisters married two brothers. In 1898, um, Agnes was born near Belgrade, which actually became part of Yugoslavia, but she and my grandfather both spoke Czech. Back then, the area was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. My grandmother and grandfather were married when they came to this country in 1920, after the end of World War I. They entered through Ellis Island, and along with Marie and Cyril and many other Czechs, they settled in Berwyn, Illinois. This was a large Czech community where most of the business shopkeepers spoke Czech. The couple settled in and started their family, which soon grew to seven. Bessie, Agnes, Anton, Frank, John, Joseph, and Robert. My grandfather did masonry work, and my grandmother had the tough task of handling the holist brood, which she did with both love and an iron hand. But with five boys, I'm told her task was not easy. Grandma pretty much made everything from scratch, mostly out of necessity, because there were so many mouths to feed, and therefore it was cheaper. She was an excellent cook, and as many cooks in that era did not have a recipe, just picked things, picked up ingredients by the handful and brought and you know and threw them in. She canned everything she could, but of all the things she canned, the mushrooms was the most special in the family, because it was truly a family affair. Before you could can them, you had to hunt them. So every last child was manned with a bag and oftentimes a stick and set out to the local woods or forest preserve to fill their bags. It was a bit of hard work, but since they were all together, it became a fun family outing that would last for hours depending on how many mushrooms the boss, grandma, wanted. Before the tedious job of cleaning the mushrooms commenced, which also everyone participated, each mushroom was inspected by grandma to make sure it was okay and not poisonous. Her children would all ask how did she know they were okay and I was told she always answered because I know. Yeah, yeah that's, that's where the fun begins. So when I was a little girl, my parents tried a couple of times to take my brother's sister and I out to the local forest preserve on a mushroom hunting expedition but we didn't even find enough to make a half pint. So my dad gave up and left the task to the experts. It was fun though while it lasted because we were all together hiking around the woods. 
My uncles John, Joe, and Bob remained bachelors and eventually moved to a wooded house on a lake in northwestern Wisconsin. You know what woods means, mushrooms. Even in her later years, and she lived to be 90, Grandma was still running the mushroom show. My uncles would drive down to Berwyn and pick her up and bring her to the north. They would pick the mushrooms and she still inspected every last one. And just like when they were little, they all cleaned the mushrooms and put them up together. The word hobi is Czech for mushroom, and since the mushroom was the object of hunting tradition and a significant part of the Czech diet, the Hobi Parade was born in Berwyn and Cicero in 1968 until present. And by the way, it's still going. It was established to honor the families who settled in this area and continued the time-honored tradition. Now, sadly, my uncle is the last survivor of the holest children, but he has continued with the tradition of hunting mushrooms and canning him by himself in true grandmother fashion. Last year, I guess he thought it was time he better pass the tradition on, so he called my sister Cindy and I in mid-October. Now you have to understand that when he called, he said, you need to come within the next two weeks or the mushrooms will be gone. So Cindy and I juggled our work schedules and away we went. We drove 400 miles north to Wisconsin and no sooner pulled into the driveway and Uncle Joe opened the doors and shoved bags in our hands and directed us to the next door neighbor's lawn, which was covered with mushrooms. We just stared at him and he said, start picking. So we broke the mushrooms off at the base from the ground and started filling our bags. Of course, me and Cindy asked the million dollar question, Uncle Joe, how do you know they are not poisonous? And of course, we got the million dollar answer, because I know. <laughs> <laughs> After two hours and many full bags of mushrooms, Uncle Joe deemed the hunting session over. I must say, Cindy and I did have fun under the watchful eye of Uncle Joe. Now the real work begins. We all sat down at the newspaper covered table and began to clean, clean each and every mushroom by throwing the debris on the floor. <laughs> I can't even imagine what a mess this was when my dad and uncle were little and there were seven of them plus grandma. This task took us several hours and Uncle Joe inspected each mushroom so quality control was maintained. The cleaned mushrooms were thrown into a large cast iron pot that was filled with water and placed in the refrigerator overnight. The next day, the mushrooms were rinsed and then placed back in the refrigerator. We did not start cooking them until Sunday afternoon. After all that, we got five pints and two half pints. It took us all weekend, but it was one of the best weekends I have spent with my Uncle Joe. I think the mushrooms are an acquired taste. I like them, I don't love them. This past Thanksgiving at my nephew's house, my sister and I proudly put out a pint of our mushrooms and announced to everyone they should try them. My brothers who love the mushrooms and used to fight over them when we were little wouldn't touch them until we finally told them they were Uncle Joe's supervised and approved. <laughs> Uncle Joe is battling cancer but so far has survived two and a half years. We already have a date set for mid-October for another round of mushroom hunting and canning. This time, we are bringing my four-year-old grandniece, Carolyn, to get another generation indoctrinated in the tradition. It is on this trip I have to learn the answer to the all-important question, how do you know they're okay? I need to know. This was so typical of the people that I encountered 30 some years ago. That, that group has, you know, gone on to heaven and what have you, but my goodness, these people really were left without any guidance. And so, um, so as I told you, here's these people again. So the lady with the, like, like the cranberry red shirt, she's the one with the asparagus and the peanut brittle. The lady with the white shorts and the pink top is the, um, the, the fried, the oven baked chicken and the chicken salad sandwiches from her mother-in-law. And the gentleman with the goatee is the one whose pig's name Bart. <laughs> 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 and 
And I don't, I really should go look up who that other poor lady is who I didn't mention, sorry. Um, but after, the, after things are over, we tend to take a troop over to the Berry area and check out the butter cow. Um, this was the best take I could ever do with all those people that you could see reflected in the mirror. Here's a much better picture that was apparently taken for some press opportunity, but at least you get to see it. Now, there was a food writer in, in, um, in Springfield who dared to suggest that the Illinois butter cow thing was rather unimaginative and they should probably check out what Iowa is doing because they did a uh, Apollo 11 moonwalk in butter. You know, I mean, that's imagination. A lot of butter, too, I imagine. Um, what is that? That's a lot of butter. It is. Right, but every year it's a cow, you know, whereas other places, I, don't worry, I'm just, you know, I think the whole thing's a hoot. But this was a chocolate mousse. Oh my God. And this started off as a joke. And then the next, you know, somebody donated the money to produce the moose, as well as keep the air conditioning just a bit colder. This was in the Iowa State Fair, just a bit colder so that the moose wouldn't no. melt. Um, and so, like these stories and things that I told you, they're, they're from this book. They're also on our website, so that's more fun. But this was done as a bicentennial project, and it was sort of done kind of at the last moment for that. Um, I had been influenced by this project uh, done with the uh, Lake and McHenry County Alliance. These are 200 objects that made history. Um, the one up in the upper left corner is from the Highland Park Historical Society. Um, there had been um, some kids out on, uh, on an ice floe that broke away. And this medal and several others were given to the people who went out there and rescued them. Now, for years when we talked, huh? The cakes were delicious. It is, but look at all the crubs. Well, you know, but it's <laughs> right. But this is a Nigella Lawson cake. Nigella Lawson has kind of a high profile in the food world. You know, does all these refined things, and there was a cake with crumbs and uneven frosting. Because for years when we would sort of talk about if we were ever going to do a book related to these recipes and things, it was like, well, we need to get, we need to get a food photographer and stylist. But all those pictures you are, that you've seen are unique. You cannot make them up. And when Randella Lawson could put a, a cake with crumbs on it, it was like, darn it, we could use the photos we already have. But that's, you know, the Kathy idea. Um, and so we, we did that, then one person thought, you know, if the stories are not good enough, whatever that means, we could interview them and enhance the stories. And at some point, these stories become theirs and suddenly they become yours, and I didn't like that idea either. I'm not trying to say all my ideas are great, some of them stink, but you know. Um, so we did this as a bicentennial project, and remember I said, look at the polenta? Take a look at the picture that's mentioned for the, that's our project there in the middle with half the polenta gone. I should have really considered carefully the picture I submitted, or at least <laughs> did a little Photoshop. But we submitted our application like in August, August, and I never heard anything. And so I finally called them in September, and the woman says, when did you submit? And I says, I don't know, the 24th or 26th. Ah, it is Illinois Constitution Day. I'll bet there's nobody in this room knows when Illinois Constitution Day is. I don't think so. But apparently by submitting on that date, this was a big day. And so if I didn't take these screenshots off their website, would no longer exist. This is my only proof that we really were part of the, we had a bicentennial project. Um, so that was what we did. Now, recently um, I did a, uh, just just because I know we're, hist you know, this is a uh, history center, so this might touch you. Um, but I did a, a talk last year at the Illinois History Conference. Ostensibly, it was supposed to talk about the book on left, the Asoli cookbook. The week before the program, the book on the, on the right from 1925 was found. So I had to quickly scan it and index it. And... Um, 
these community cookbooks, these women's cookbooks, usually have a project idea in mind. And in this case, the one on the left was for the first public beach in Highland Park, is what it helped fund. And the book on the right from 1925 helped the funding of uh, a um, clubhouse. Um, the one where we have the tea, that's, that was helped to, fund, helped to fund that. So the first book had actually over 600 cookbooks and there was like 130 contributors. The second cookbook from 1925 had 184 contributors and had just over around 450 recipes. So it takes an army to do these, these books. And now uh, it's more like, not do as I say, but I haven't done it yet, but it's my idea is that all these names go on to our website so that people can perhaps find their relative. And in fact, when I was scanning the second book, um, a woman came up to me, I know, and she goes, and she asked me what I was doing, and I said, the book from 1925, she goes, are there any recipes for my grandmother? And I said, I don't know, but I'll let you know later. Six recipes from her grandmother were in that book. And she was like totally, totally thrilled. Now, like I said, when I do this, this was how I indexed it. I used a uh, Excel sheet and I marked you know, the, the recipe, where it was in the book, what they call them, these things an index, but really was, was chapter titles. The index was really not, was lacking. And, and I did this so that if I wanted to find things, I could quickly find it. If I had to go through that book back and forth, I'd be going crazy. But I had an, another reason for doing all this. A few years ago, my aunt's mother died. Um, she was buried with a rosette that she won at the state fair. That was one of her precious mementos she wanted to take with her. And this was, you know, in the air, I mean, she had, she married young, like 20. She had, she kept a garden. She canned like this Mrs. Hollis. You know, she did a lot of work, but you know, it is, a, and that was that era, you know, your, your name in the newspaper is, you know, your birth, your wedding, and your obituary. So this was a, a very precious moment for her, getting that ribbon. I think so too. I think so too. Well, thank you for your time today. Thank you.